Section 27 of Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 1, by John Calvin. Translated by Henry Beveridge. Chapter 17, Part 1. Use to be made of the Doctrine of Providence. This chapter may be conveniently divided into two parts. One, a general explanation is given of the doctrine of divine providence, in so far as conducive to the solid instruction and consolation of the godly, section 1, and specially sections 2 through 12. First, however, those are refuted who deny that the world is governed by the secret and incomprehensible counsel of God. Those also who throw the blame of all wickedness upon God and absurdly pretend that exercises of piety are useless, sections 2 through 5. Thereafter is added a holy meditation on divine providence, which, in the case of prosperity, is painted to the life, sections 6 through 11. 2. A solution of two objections from passages of Scripture, which attribute repentance to God, and speak of something like an abrogation of His decrees. Sections. 1. Summary of the Doctrine of Divine Providence. 1. It embraces the future and the past. 2. It works by means, without means, and against means. 3. Mankind, and particularly the Church, the object of special care. 4. The mode of administration usually secret, but always just. This last point more fully considered. 2. The profane denial that the world is governed by the secret counsel of God, refuted by passages of Scripture, salutary counsel. 3. This doctrine as to the secret counsel of God in the government of the world gives no countenance either to the impiety of those who throw the blame of their wickedness upon God, the petulance of those who reject means, or the error of those who neglect the duties of religion. 4. As regards future events, the doctrine of divine providence not inconsistent with deliberation on the part of man. 5. In regard to past events, it is absurd to argue that crimes ought not to be punished because they are in accordance with the divine decrees. 1. The wicked resist the declared will of God. 2. They are condemned by conscience. 3. The essence and guilt of the crime is in themselves, though God uses them as instruments. 6. A holy meditation on divine providence. 1. All things happen by the ordination of God. 2. All things contribute to the advantage of the godly. 3. The hearts of men and all their endeavors are in the hand of God. 4. Providence watches for the safety of the righteous. 5. God has a special care of his elect. 7. Meditation on Providence Continued 6. God in various ways curbs and defeats the enemies of the church. 7. He overrules all creatures, even Satan himself, for the good of his people. 8. Meditation on Providence Continued 8. He trains the godly to patience and moderation. Examples. Joseph, Job, and David. 9. He shakes off their lethargy and urges them to repentance. 9. Meditation Continued 10. The right use of inferior causes explained. 11. When the godly become negligent or imprudent in the discharge of duty, providence reminds them of their fault. 12. It condemns the iniquities of the wicked. 13. It produces a right consideration of the future, rendering the servants of God prudent, diligent, and active. 14. It causes them to resign themselves to the wisdom and omnipotence of God, and, at the same time, makes them diligent in their calling. 10. Meditation continued. 15. Though human life is beset with innumerable evils, the righteous, trusting to divine providence, feel perfectly secure. 11. The use of the foregoing meditation. 12. The second part of the chapter, disposing of two objections. 1. That scripture represents God as changing his purpose or repenting, and that, therefore, his providence is not fixed. Answer to this first objection. Proof from scripture that God cannot repent. 13. 
why repentance attributed to God. 14. Second objection, that scripture speaks of an annulment of the divine decrees. Objection answered. Answer confirmed by an example. 1. Moreover, such is the proneness of the human mind to indulge in vain subtleties, that it becomes almost impossible for those who do not see the sound and proper use of this doctrine, to avoid entangling themselves in perplexing difficulties. It will, therefore, be proper here to advert to the end which Scripture has in view in teaching that all things are divinely ordained. And it is to be observed, first, that the providence of God is to be considered with reference both to the past and the future, and secondly, that in overruling all things, it works at one time with means, at another without means, and at another against means. Lastly, the design of God is to show that he takes care of the whole human race, but is especially vigilant in governing the church, which he favors with a closer inspection. Moreover, we must add, that although the paternal favor and beneficence, as well as the judicial severity of God, is often conspicuous in the whole course of his providence, yet occasionally, as the causes of events are concealed, the thought is apt to rise that human affairs are whirled about by a blind impulse of fortune, or our carnal nature inclines us to speak as if God were amusing himself by tossing men up and down like balls. It is true, indeed, that if with sedate and quiet minds we were disposed to learn, the issue would at length make it manifest that the counsel of God was in accordance with the highest reason, that his purpose was either to train his people to patience, correct their depraved affections, tame their wantonness, inure them to self-denial, and arouse them from torpor, or, on the other hand, to cast down the proud, defeat the craftiness of the ungodly, and frustrate all their schemes. How much soever causes may escape our notice, we must feel assured that they are deposited with him, and accordingly exclaim with David, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Psalm 40, verse 5. For while our adversaries ought always to remind us of our sins, that the punishment may incline us to repentance, we see, moreover, how Christ declares there is something more in the secret counsel of his Father than to chastise every one as he deserves. For he says of the man who was born blind, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. John 9, verse 3. Here, where calamity takes precedence even of birth, our carnal sense murmurs as if God were unmerciful in thus afflicting those who have not offended. But Christ declares that, provided we had eyes clear enough, we should perceive that in this spectacle the glory of his Father is brightly displayed. We must use modesty, not as it were compelling God to render an account, but so revering his hidden judgments as to account his will the best of all reasons. When the sky is overcast with dense clouds, and a violent tempest arises, the darkness which is presented to our eye, and the thunder which strikes our ears, and stupefies all our senses with terror, make us imagine that everything is thrown into confusion, though in the firmament itself all continues quiet and serene. In the same way, when the tumultuous aspect of human affairs unfits us for judging, we should still hold that God, in the pure light of his justice and wisdom, keeps all these commotions in due subordination, and conducts them to their proper end. And certainly in this matter many display monstrous infatuation, presuming to subject the works of God to their calculation, and discuss his secret counsels, as well as to pass a precipitate judgment on things unknown, and that with greater license than on the doings of mortal men. What can be more preposterous than to show modesty toward our equals, and choose rather to suspend our judgment than incur the blame of rashness, while we petulantly insult the hidden judgments of God, judgments which it becomes us to look up to and revere? 2. No man, therefore, will duly and usefully ponder on the providence of God, save he who recollects that he has to do with his own Maker, and the Maker of the world, and in the exercise of the humility which becomes him, manifests both fear and reverence. 
hence it is that on the present day so many dogs tear this doctrine with envenomed teeth or at least assail it with their bark refusing to give more license to god than their own reason dictates to themselves with what petulance too are we assailed for not being contented with the precepts of the law in which the will of god is comprehended and for maintaining that the world is governed by his secret counsels as if our doctrine were the figment of our own brain and were not distinctly declared by the spirit and repeated in innumerable forms of expression since some feeling of shame restrains them from daring to belch forth their blasphemies against heaven that they may give the freer vent to their rage they pretend to pick a quarrel with us but if they refuse to admit that every event which happens in the world is governed by the incomprehensible counsel of god let them explain to what effect scripture declares that his judgments are a great deep psalm thirty six verse seven for when moses exclaims that the will of god quote, is not in heaven that thou shouldst say who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say who shall go over the sea and bring it unto us End quote. deuteronomy thirty verses twelve and thirteen because it was familiarly expounded in the law it follows that there must be another hidden will which is compared to a great deep it is of this will paul exclaims oh the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counsellor romans eleven verses thirty three and thirty four it is true indeed that in the law and the gospel are comprehended mysteries which far transcend the measure of our sense but since god to enable his people to understand these mysteries which he has deigned to reveal in his word enlightens their minds with a spirit of understanding they are now no longer a deep but a path in which they can walk safely a lamp to guide their feet a light of life a school of clear and certain truth but the admirable method of governing the world is justly called a deep because while it lies hid from us it is to be reverently adored both views moses has beautifully expressed in a few words secret things saith he belong unto the lord our god but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children for ever deuteronomy twenty nine verse twenty nine we see how he enjoins us not only studiously to meditate on the law but to look up with reverence to the secret providence of god the book of job also in order to keep our minds humble contains a description of this lofty theme the author of the book after taking an ample survey of the universe and discoursing magnificently on the works of god at length adds lo these are parts of his ways but how little a portion is heard of him job twenty six verse fourteen for which reason he in another passage distinguishes between the wisdom which dwells in god and the measure of wisdom which he has assigned to man job twenty eight verse twenty one and twenty eight after discoursing of the secrets of nature he says that wisdom is hid from the eyes of all living that god understandeth the way thereof shortly after he adds that it has been divulged that it might be investigated for quote, unto man he said behold the fear of the lord that is wisdom End quote. to this the words of augustine refer quote, as we do not know all the things which god does respecting us in the best order we ought with good intention to act according to the law and in some things be acted upon according to the law his providence being a law immutable therefore since god claims to himself the right of governing the world a right unknown to us let it be our law of modesty and soberness to acquiesce in his supreme authority regarding his will as our only rule of justice and the most perfect cause of all things not that absolute will indeed of which sophists prate when by a profane and impious divorce they separate his justice from his power but that universal overruling providence from which nothing flows that is not right though the reasons thereof may be concealed three those who have learned this modesty will neither murmur against god for adversity in time past nor charge him with the blame of their own wickedness as homer's agamemnon does 
Ego doik aitios eimi, ala zeus kai moira. Blame not me, but Jupiter and fate. On the other hand, they will not, like the youth in Plautus, destroy themselves in despairs as if hurried away by the fates. Quote, Unstable is the condition of affairs. Instead of doing as they list, men only fulfill their fate. I will hie me to a rock, and there end my fortune with my life. End quote nor will they, under the example of another, use the name of God as a cloak for their crimes. For in another comedy, Lyconides thus expresses himself, quote, God was the impeller, I believe the gods wished it. Did they not wish it, it would not be done, I know. End quote. They will rather inquire and learn from Scripture what is pleasing to God, and then, under the guidance of the Spirit, endeavor to attain it. Prepared to follow whithersoever God may call, they will show by their example that nothing is more useful than the knowledge of this doctrine, which perverse men undeservedly assail, because it is sometimes wickedly abused. The profane make such a bluster with their foolish puerilities, that they almost, according to the expression, confound heaven and earth. If the Lord has marked the moment of our death, it cannot be escaped. It is vain to toil and use precaution. Therefore, when one ventures not to travel on a road which he hears is infested by robbers, when another calls in the physician and annoys himself with drugs for the sake of his health, a third abstains from coarser food, that he may not injure a sickly constitution, and a fourth fears to dwell in a ruinous house, when all, in short, devise, and, with great eagerness of mind, strike out paths by which they may attain the objects of their desire, either these are all vain remedies, laid hold of to correct the will of God, or his certain decree does not fix the limits of life and death, health and sickness, peace and war, and other matters which men, according as they desire and hate, study by their own industry to secure or avoid. Nay, these trifles even infer, and the prayers of the faithful must be perverse, not to say superfluous, because they entreat the Lord to make a provision for things which he has decreed from eternity and then, imputing whatever happens to the providence of God, they connive at the man who is known to have expressly designed it. Has an assassin slain an honest citizen? He has, they say, executed the counsel of God. Has someone committed theft or adultery? The deed having been provided and ordained by the Lord, he is the minister of his providence. Has a son waited with indifference for the death of his parent, without trying any remedy? He could not oppose God, who had so predetermined from eternity. Thus all crimes receive the name of virtues, as being in accordance with divine ordination. 4. As regards future events, Solomon easily reconciles human deliberation with divine providence. For while he derides the stupidity of those who presume to undertake anything without God, as if they were not ruled by his hand, he elsewhere thus expresses himself, a man's heart deviseth his ways, but the Lord directeth his steps. Proverbs 16, verse 9. Intimating that the eternal decrees of God by no means prevent us from proceeding, under his will, to provide for ourselves and arrange all our affairs. And the reason for this is clear. For he who has fixed the boundaries of our life has at the same time entrusted us with the care of it, provided us with means of preserving it, forewarned us of the dangers to which we are exposed, and supplied cautions and remedies that we may not be overwhelmed unawares. Now our duty is clear, namely, since the Lord has committed to us the defense of our life, to defend it, since he offers assistance, to use it, since he forewarns us of danger, not to rush on heedless, since he supplies remedies, not to neglect them. But it is said, a danger that is not fatal will not hurt us, and one that is fatal cannot be resisted by any precaution. But what if dangers are not fatal, merely because the Lord has furnished you with the means of warding them off and surmounting them? See how far your reasoning accords with the order of divine procedure. You infer that danger is not to be guarded against, because, if it is not fatal, you shall escape without precaution." whereas the Lord enjoins you to guard against it just because he wills it not to be fatal. These insane cavillers overlook what is plainly before their eyes, that is, 
that the Lord has furnished men with the artful of deliberation and caution, that they may employ them in subservience to his providence in the preservation of their life, while, on the contrary, by neglect and sloth, they bring upon themselves the evils which he has annexed to them. How comes it that a provident man, while he consults for his safety, disentangles himself from impending evils, while a foolish man, through unadvised temerity, perishes, unless it be that prudence and folly are, in either case, instruments of divine dispensation? God has been pleased to conceal from us all future events, that we may prepare for them as doubtful, and cease not to apply the provided remedies until they have either been overcome, or have proved too much for all our care. Hence, I formerly observed, that the providence of God does not interpose simply, but, by employing means, assumes, as it were, a visible form. 5. By the same class of persons, past events are referred improperly and inconsiderately to simple providence. As all contingencies whatsoever depend on it, therefore, neither thefts nor adulteries nor murders are perpetrated without an interposition of the divine will. Why then, they ask, should the thief be punished for robbing him whom the Lord chose to chastise with poverty? Why should the murderer be punished for slaying him whose life the Lord had terminated? If all such persons serve the will of God, why should they be punished? I deny that they serve the will of God, for we cannot say that he who is carried away by a wicked mind performs service on the order of God when he is only following his own malignant desires. He obeys God, who, being instructed in his will, hastens in the direction in which God calls him. But how are we so instructed, unless by his word? The will declared by his word is, therefore, that which we must keep in view in acting. God requires of us nothing but what he enjoins. If we design anything contrary to his precept, it is not obedience, but contumacy and transgression. But if he did not will it, we could not do it. I admit this. But do we act wickedly for the purpose of yielding obedience to him? This, assuredly, he does not command. Nay, rather we rush on, not thinking of what he wishes, but so inflamed by our own passionate lust, that, with destined purpose, we strive against him. And in this way, while acting wickedly, we serve his righteous ordination, since in his boundless wisdom he well knows how to use bad instruments for good purposes. And see how absurd this mode of arguing is. They will have it that crimes ought not to be punished in their authors, because they are not committed without the dispensation of God. I concede more, that thieves and murderers and other evildoers are instruments of divine providence, being employed by the Lord himself to execute the judgments which he has resolved to inflict but I deny that this forms any excuse for their misdeeds. For how? Will they implicate God in the same iniquity with themselves, or will they cloak their depravity by his righteousness? They cannot exculpate themselves, for their own conscience condemns them. They cannot charge God, since they perceive the whole wickedness in themselves, and nothing in him save the legitimate use of their wickedness. But it is said he works by their means, and whence, I pray, the fetid odor of a dead body which has been unconfined and putrefied by the sun's heat. All see that it is excited by the rays of the sun, but no man therefore says that the fetid odor is in them. In the same way, while the matter and guilt of wickedness belongs to the wicked man, why should it be thought that God contracts any impurity in using it at pleasure as his instrument? have done, then, with that dog-like petulance which may, indeed, bay from a distance at the justice of God, but cannot reach it. 6. These calumnies, or rather frenzied dreams, will easily be dispelled by a pure and holy meditation on divine providence, meditation such as piety enjoins, that we may thence derive the best and sweetest fruit. The Christian, then, being most fully persuaded, that all things come to pass by the dispensation of God, and that nothing happens fortuitously, will always direct his eye to him as the principal cause of events, at the same time paying due regard to inferior causes in their own place. Next, he will have no doubt that a special providence is awake for his preservation, 
and will not suffer anything to happen that will not turn to his good and safety. But as its business is first with men and then with other creatures, he will feel assured that the providence of God reigns over both. In regard to men, good as well as bad, he will acknowledge that their counsels, wishes, aims, and faculties are so under his hand that he has full power to turn them in whatever direction and constrain them as often as he pleases. The fact that a special providence watches over the safety of believers is attested by a vast number of the clearest promises. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of mine eye. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Nay, the chief aim of the historical books of Scripture is to show that the ways of his saints are so carefully guarded by the Lord as to prevent them even from dashing their foot against a stone. Therefore, as we a little ago justly exploded the opinion of those who feign a universal providence, which does not condescend to take special care of every creature, so it is of the highest moment that we should specially recognize this care towards ourselves. Hence our Saviour, after declaring that even a sparrow falls not to the ground without the will of his father, immediately makes the application that being more valuable than many sparrows, we ought to consider that God provides more carefully for us. He even extends this so far as to assure us that the hairs of our head are all numbered. What more can we wish if not even a hair of our head can fall save in accordance with his will? I speak not merely of the human race in general. God having chosen the church for his abode, there cannot be a doubt that in governing it he gives singular manifestations of his paternal care. End of section 27